funding we're looking to do. All right, there's our there's our notification. Um, I'm India, and I'm the director of lending at Foodshed Capital. And I'm also joined by Erica Helen, Foodcap's director of operations, and Michael Riley, Foodcap's executive director. Uh, this workshop was funded in part through a cooperative agreement with the U.S. Small Business Association, so many thanks for their support. Um, and a big thank you as well to Community Investment Collaborative for partnering with us on the grant. We're excited to co-present today as well with Sammy Teleton, the COO and co-founder of FarmRaise. Um, Sammy will be sharing more info about grants available to farmers and the services that FarmRaise offers to make them more accessible. But before we get into that, I want to share a little bit about our work here at FoodCap. All right, so our mission is to foster an equitable, regenerative local food economy through financial stewardship to farms uh, and local food businesses as well. The two main ways we accomplish this are low-cost patient capital and technical assistance. So as we'll discuss in a second, we want to make sure our borrowers feel confident about the debt that they take on. Um, an important part of our work is providing financial and business training services alongside each loan. Uh, so we can feel comfortable and our borrowers can as well. Um, since 2019, we've closed about 60 loans with an average loan size of roughly $20,000. Next slide. All right, um, background. So our team approaches this work with a diverse variety of backgrounds. Um, our team has grown in the past year and we've been really fortunate to bring on Erica Helen. Um, so Erica, if you wanna introduce yourself. Sure, um, I'll just quickly add in. Um, so of this bulleted list here, I bring the diversified livestock production and uh, business ownership to the table. I'm the former co-owner of a farm called Free Union Grass Farm, which is just outside of Charlottesville, Virginia. We raised, um, 100% grass-fed beef, forest-fed pork, and pastured poultry. Um, and the farm is still in operation, thriving, survived the pandemic, um, but I'm now an, a very enthusiastic member of the FoodCap team. So I'll talk to you a little bit more in a minute. Yeah, great. Thank you, Erica. Um, before I joined FoodCap at the beginning of 2020, um, I studied environmental sustainability and entrepreneurship at UVA. Um, and I also worked at an angel investment network where I gained some hands-on experience working with a variety of different companies um, and really sitting down with entrepreneurs to talk through business plans. So I'm excited to bring that skill set to my work here at FoodCap as well. Um, I've also been really fortunate to have the tremendous pleasure of farming once a week on a diversified vegetable outside, a diversified vegetable operation outside of Richmond um, this season. So that's been, that's been a really exciting feature of my year. Next slide. Why this workshop? Um, as I mentioned earlier, at FoodCap, we really wanna be partners in supporting the success of all of our borrowers. So this definitely means providing patient capital, um, and that's certainly a huge part of what we do. Uh, but we also work closely with every applicant to make sure that there is smart preparation and planning for managing the loan. Um, we often work with folks that have a really clear vision, for example, on how their loan will improve production. Um, but it's equally important to ensure that there's a really strong business strategy in place. Accessing capital alone doesn't necessarily mean success. Um, it's really important to think about how your loan will catalyze your business and have answers to questions like, do I have the bookkeeping acumen to analyze cash flow? Um, and do I have a marketing strategy to sell this product? On that note, uh, we'll also be offering some more workshops in this series to go over key bookkeeping and marketing strategies. Um, so stay tuned. Those should be really helpful. Um, a last point. If you find yourself thinking through these questions, maybe we've, we work together um, or you're pursuing a loan elsewhere and you don't quite have that plan or that structure in place, that's a really good time to consider grant funding. Um, so Sammy will cover that in, in more detail lately, but, uh, later, but as we're sort of working through this workshop, um, it's important to kind of keep those dual options in mind. 
next slide. Yeah, so the risks and the rewards of loans. Um, we work with a lot of farmers that are hesitant to take on debt uh, and we completely get that. Um, there's a tendency to sort of purchase assets outright with cash. And while that might be easier to manage or sort of seem easier to manage, it can also limit operational cash flow. Um, on the other hand, the flip side of that can be low or no interest capital makes recurring costs much more manageable um, and kind of frees up those funds to keep them available for smaller expenses. So with a good strategy, debt is an incredibly useful tool uh, for managing cash flow and also just for helping to scale your operation. So it's really important to understand what you're signing up for when you decide to take on debt. Um, and being prepared is, is key to successfully leveraging those benefits. Um, so that could look like a loan to fund an additional piece of equipment, um, or it could mean bringing on a new hire to expand your operation. And a little later on, uh, we'll, we'll discuss some specific um, use of loan funds that, that FoodCap often supports. All right, I'll go ahead and turn it over to Erica here and she'll talk to you a little bit more about some of the traditional funding operations or options um, and, and her own experience with that as a farmer. Sure. So we'll start kind of with the high level traditional overview before we move into grant stuff. Um, bank loans of, you know, commercial bank loans are always an option. Uh, the cons here are that rates are going to be higher. A lot of traditional lending institutions don't even view small farms as a viable business worth lending to. If they do, they're going to deem you as a higher risk and slap you with a higher rate in the 10 to 15% range at times. Um, fees to manage those accounts are also very typical. Um, almost 100% of the time, these uh, loans will require the use of collateral that you may or may not have. The loan application process is fairly lengthy. There's gonna be a lot of paperwork involved and you'll need to be pretty organized about the kinds of reports that you're providing them. You're also gonna be looking at um, minimum lending thresholds. A lot of places will require a $25,000 starting loan, which if you're just gonna, getting your feet wet with farming, that may be a lot more than you need. So another option, um, also traditional lending institutions are revolving lines of credit. Um, these are essentially, you could treat them a little bit like a credit card, but with a much lower rate. So my farm actually had a $50,000 line of credit um, that we rarely used. Uh, we rarely maxed out. It was essentially a cushion. Um, and I believe the interest rate was between three and 4%, which if we found ourselves in a pinch in terms of cash flow, it was really nice to have that buffer. Um, and we essentially worked with a local lender, a small bank here in Virginia called Old Dominion. Um, it was a word of mouth recommendation and someone really sort of stuck their neck out for us to work with us. Um, and I don't know that everyone at that institution would have. Um, so that was a great situation. There were, you know, um, there was a, an interest rate to think of. There were some fees associated with the account. And there was also a requirement for a checking account associated with the re revolving line of credit. And we needed to have a minimum amount of capital in there at all times. So those are just some things to consider. Um, this last piece, credit cards, I almost hate even bringing it up because I really like to discourage people from using credit cards for financing purposes. Um, those interest rates, I'm sure you've all seen them between 20 and 30 percent. The, the trick to using credit cards to your advantage is to make sure that you always have the capital in cash flow to pay off your, your debt every month. So for example, my farm would put most of our feed bills on a credit card, um, a business credit card, save up our points and then use those points for personal use, which there's no issues with that whatsoever. Use those points each year to purchase a plane ticket to a really lovely um, tropical vacation. So you can really use these as a tool if you are dealing with higher expenses, but definitely do not use them for financing. <laughs> Next slide, please. All right, so getting more into the farm specific options, um, USDA FSA loans uh, offer a few different categories for beginning farmers and ranchers. Um, these are folks who have been in operation for fewer than 10 years. Um, the main categories are listed here. So you've got farm ownership, 
farm operating capital, farm microloans, and direct down payment loans. So those are obviously for different purposes. You've got you know, purchasing land um, for your operation, operating expenses, uh, microloans uh, for just smaller investments, and then they'll actually do a portion of a, direct, a down payment if you can come up with 5% of that. So then they'll cover the remaining 45%. So there are some great options that FSA offers. The interest rates are pretty low. You'll see here the range is currently between one and a half and just under 3%. This is certainly very affordable for a lot of folks. And the terms are pretty workable um, between seven years um, for the shorter or for the smaller loans and 20 to 30 years for uh, longer term or land loans. That said, um, if any of you have worked with the USDA before, you'll know that it might not be for all of you. The first thing you need to do with any of these loans is prove that you cannot achieve financing elsewhere. So essentially you're looking at a dual application. You need to try to apply at a traditional lending institution first, be denied, and then prove that when you, whenever you go to the FSA with your application. Um, you also need a three-year financial history. So if you're just getting started, these might not be a good option for you. And the process is challenging. There's a lot of paperwork required. You need to be organized and it can just generally be time consuming. So an alternative to that is, um, is our model here at Food Shed Capital. And I'll pass it back to India to talk you through that. Great, thanks Erica. Um, yeah, traditional options, you know, obviously they exist um, and they're fine and, and worth looking into. Uh, but as Erica discussed, there are definitely limitations and that's why we started our work. So our lending prioritizes socially disadvantaged and minority borrowers that have long been discriminated against in the financial system. Um, and we also highly value a dedication to regenerative practices. Um, so that's a, that's a big part, part of working with us. Uh, you know you have a partner. Um, we also strongly emphasize ongoing partnerships with our portfolio borrowers, both in providing some of that technical assistance pre-loan and then after you receive your loan, um, we like to stay in touch, hear how things are going and just continue to be a resource. So we strive to do this through low rates and offering really flexible terms. Um, we typically offer an interest rate between two to 4%, just depending on the loan. Um, but we also offer a 0% interest rate for black farmers, thanks to our black farmer food fund. Um, currently our lending is capped at $50,000, but we expect that to increase significantly in 2022. So if you have a large project that you wanna chat about with us, um, definitely still reach out and stay tuned for updates on that. And then regarding our flexible terms, so as a director of lending, I work really closely with each and every borrower um, to find custom terms that make repayment manageable so you can you know, feel really confident about the loan that you're taking on. Um, for example, we offer a grace period where no payments are due for a set amount of months after the loan is made. Um, and we also accept monthly, quarterly, biannual, or annual repayments, just depending on how your business is structured, um, the times of year that, you know, that are cash flow heavy um, and what you feel most comfortable with. Next slide. All right, our types of loans. Um, so we know that as the farmer or the business owner, you certainly understand your operation much better than we ever will. Um, so we've structured our lending to allow ideally for really flexible use of funds to best suit your needs. Um, we've worked with folks to fund equipment and infrastructure, uh, working capital plans and actions to transition to more regenerative practices um, and also bringing on new employees to help expand the business. Um, we anticipate offering land loans in the coming year as well in collaboration with some of our partner organizations. So again, if you have a project, uh, definitely keep in touch with us and stay connected. Um, in addition to our more standard loans, um, we also offer bridge loans and bridge funding. Um, and those are really helpful specifically when working with grants. So if you've received a grant, once your grant is approved, um, we can fund the reimbursable amount and that can help get you started immediately. So then when, uh, when your grant funds are issued, 
um, and you've been reimbursed after you've shown proof that the work has been done, we can then get repaid in full. Um, so it's just, just a really a simple way to sort of um, access the funding that will help you get started on your grant funded project without having to worry about backing all of that with your own cash flow. Um, yeah, so as we've covered, debt can be a really fantastic tool um, and we look to be a, a patient and flexible partner um, in servicing some of your capital needs. But we also wanna make sure that you know how to access grant funding. Um, if you can access grant funding, it is definitely worth pursuing. Um, so I'll go ahead and turn it over to Sammy from FarmRaise to talk about how to access some of that grant funding in a really streamlined way. Thank you, India. I will queue up my screen to share with you all. And just a shout out to the work that India, Erica, and Michael are doing at Food Shed. It's pretty um, unique to see a partner in lending that is so focused on enabling farmers in the way that they're doing it. Um, the, the loans that they talked about are not commonplace and especially like bridge loans, you know, that's, it's really impactful to have that available. Um, and hopefully you'll see why it's so powerful after we talk a bit about grants. So let's dive in. Um, so my name is Sammy. I am the one of the three co-founders and the chief operating officer at FarmRaise, which is a relatively new company. We started in March of 2020, an interesting time to start a business, <laughs> to say the least. And we are here to help farmers unlock funding. We talked with over 100 farmers before building out the business concept and learned that um, no surprise, accessing funding is one of the biggest barriers that farmers face. And we know there's grant funding out there. I used to work at the USDA for a grant program called SARE, which is the Sustainable Agriculture Research and Education Program. There are billions available in grants to farmers, but it's difficult for farmers to learn about these grants and take advantage of them. So today, what I'm hoping to talk with you all about is how we can take advantage of grants on the farm, some of the nuances you need to know, and how farm raise can be a partner to you and, and help you access those grants. And so our model is that we are trying to build out this one-stop shop for farm funding uh, in which we connect you with all kinds of funding opportunities ranging from federal cost-sharing grants to conservation district programs um, to even helping you evaluate private capital options and make sure you can unlock those for your farm projects. So I'm going to give a brief tour of the grant landscape and talk about some of the nuances that you should be thinking about as you're looking at grants for the farm. And then we can talk a bit about how you can be the most prepared for these programs to take advantage of these grants and then apply for them. And then I think we'll have some time at the end for Q&A and I look forward to that. So at a high level, farm grants are available from three institutions primarily, but this is not comprehensive of all the options that might be out there. Um, the basics are that the US Department of Agriculture at a federal level offers about 3 billion in grants each year to farmers, direct to farmers. And then state departments of agriculture um, also offer grant funding. And so that's gonna be dependent on your state, how much is available to you. Virginia has invested heavily in conservation and water quality in your state. Um, and then local conservation districts also will have funding available um, for fencing, water quality initiatives, cover cropping, soil erosion projects, that type of thing. And then you might have seen some of these acronyms before. These are the five agencies within the US Department of Agriculture at a federal level that administer grant programs. And so some you know, familiar faces, hopefully for you all, the Natural Resource Conservation Service is a big one that's involved in every county across the US. The Farm Service Agency shares an office with them usually, and they will also yeah. sometimes house the local conservation districts. Um, there's also Rural Development and the Ag Marketing Service. They administer some grants as well. 
And then the SARE program that I mentioned is another USDA program that works directly to administer grants to farmers. One thing I want to clarify um, and a question I often get from farmers is um, who actually gets the money? Because there are some grant programs that seem like they're targeted directly towards farmers, but actually the funds are flowing through a different institution before they reach you. So just to clarify, there's really two, um, two ways the funds get dispersed. One is that the funds are given directly to you for specific projects on the farm. And grants are pretty limited and focused to stewardship projects on the farm and business development. So like doubling your revenue or increasing your marketing channels or adding value to your project or yeah, to your products. Um, grants given directly to farmers are probably not going to cover infrastructure expenses or big equipment purchases or land purchases. So there are categories you need to be aware of that'll kind of um, tell you whether you need a loan or a grant. And so just keep in mind as a rule of thumb that if you have a stewardship related project or a marketing or business development related project, probably a good idea to pursue a grant to help with that. And so of the grants given directly to farmers, you know, these ones are easier for you to source yourself. You don't have to do a lot of digging to find them. Um, you can often contact an organization like FarmRaise, your extension office, or the local USDA service center to learn about these grants. The, some examples that you might have heard before include the Environmental Quality Incentives Program, the SARE Program, and the Value Added Producer Grant. So you as the farmer apply yourself and you work with the funder directly. Then there's a second subset of grants that's a little harder to get your arms around as a farmer. And these are grants that are administered from the USDA or the State Department of Agriculture and given directly to an institution, a nonprofit, a university, um, or a research institution. And that, and part of the project that that institution is doing with that grant money is actually giving financial assistance to farmers. So the reason these are more difficult to find is that you have to know who's getting those federal funds and let them know that you're interested in being a part of that project. And that's something that farmers and other extension offices or these institutions themselves can let you know about. Some examples include specialty crop grants, um, local food promotion program, farmers market promotion program grants, and conservation innovation grants. And so if you've heard some of these before and you thought I might apply to them, unfortunately, as a as an individual operator, you're probably not going to stand much of a chance to get that because it's intended for use by a larger institution that can work with multiple farmers. But it's good to be aware of them because if there's one in your area, you could participate and get funding through it. The other um, nuance I'll share about grants is something that was touched upon by India earlier, which is that grants are often given as reimbursement. And so while it's very exciting to have a bit of no, you know, no payback money to invest in the farm, you do have to first put out a capital outlay to put the practice in place before you can get the grant money in your account. And so there are a couple ways to work within this constraint. One is you might, if you have the cash, you can use your own money for the practice and then submit proof of implementation, whether photo documentation or a receipt to the agency and they will put the money in your account. Usually it takes two weeks for the first time you submit your receipts for reimbursement and then it's much quicker each time after that. There's also something wonderful you can do, which is if you have connections to contractors that are going to do the work for you. Let's say you wanted to put in fencing to support rotational grazing and you were getting funding from Equip to do that. You could work with a contractor and tell them, hey, I'm going to get this money to pay you, but I need to put the practice in place first. Can you put the practice in place? We'll sign an agreement. I'll pay you the money after I get reimbursed from USDA and do it that way. Um, the third is accessing bridge loans through entities like Food Shed that can help you cover those costs. And that's also a great option to have available. I will say there 
there are some programs that will offer half of the money up front to you. Um, SARE is one that will do that because they know that it's hard to find that capital to get started sometimes. And then the Natural Resource Conservation Service also offers a, basically an upfront disbursement of funds to those farmers that qualify as historically underserved or beginning farmers. If you have questions about those definitions, we can definitely talk about that after. Um, it's basically farmers that have been socially disadvantaged, so farmers of color, indigenous farmers, or have served in the military recently and are veterans. Um, and then are, there are also farmers in low income areas that can qualify as historically underserved as well. This is probably the most important question because um, it's, it's really important for your time and prioritization as a farmer to know whether it's, you're ready to apply for grants. And so I wanna talk a little bit about some basics on whether or not you qualify at a high level. Know that each grant program is gonna get more specific and have some more restrictive qualifications. But at a very high level, you probably qualify for farm grants and can be looking at them if you control land through a lease or a deed or somehow can prove that you have control of land for at least a year. If you have had at least a year of sales, such as proven through a Schedule F, so filing taxes as a farmer. Um, and the reason you need this is that many grants are going to ask you to use your history as a farmer to create a narrative that shows why they, the grant being funded to you will be successful. They want to see that you've had a baseline history. There's some planning grants that you can uh, be pretty new and apply for, but you do need to be able to illustrate that you have the resources to make the grant happen. And so generally we tell people one year of sales is, is like a pretty safe range to be at. And then this is pretty important. You do need to currently be growing crops or raising animals. Um, with We get a lot of farmers that come to us at Farm Raise who are so excited to get started and want to access grants. And unfortunately, um, there aren't a lot of grants available for startup operations. So, and, and that kind of gets into the next part of this slide, which is when you don't qualify for grants. So if you don't currently have crops or livestock, um, or if you're truly just starting up and, and really don't have baseline infrastructure, land, equipment, or products, probably not a good idea to look at grants. You're going to need some experience, some sales, and some, um, some production to, to qualify for grants. Okay. So we've got some baseline knowledge. We understand a couple of the important ins and outs of grants. I wanna talk now about how to apply. And so the biggest thing is, is doing that planning work. And it's so important, taking some time to reflect, to do some research. You need to have a clear sense of what it is you want to accomplish on the farm. And I like to tell people to look for the next five years because you never know um, it, it'll always be handy if you know where you're going because you can take advantage of opportunities as they come up. So the first step is really to identify and priority rank your goals. You want to pull out different themes. Are you focused on expanding the farm? Are you focused on business development, doubling your sales, for example, or reaching a new audience through a new marketing channel? Are you focused on conservation? Are there resource concerns? These are some of the questions you need to sit down and answer to help guide your grant search. And then you're gonna want to broadly approximate how much money you're gonna need for these projects. And I would encourage you to think about it in little bite-sized chunks. So you might wanna apply cover crops across all of your acreage, but could you start with a smaller amount and test that out? And if so, what does that look like? And then you need to think about, okay, which of these things do I need to get done right away versus which things are um, really important for the long term? And how can I think about stacking the urgent versus the important in my wish list? So that's the first step. Second, you need to then use all of that good reflection and find the options that are best for you. So at Farm Raise, we've created an eligibility quiz that kind of takes in some of the things I just talked about to tell you which 
grants that you might be most eligible for. The eligibility quiz is free. You can access it on the website if you hit get started when you go to farmraise.com. And it'll tell you at a high level which federal grants you're eligible for and, and how much money you could possibly look at getting from those grants. Um, and then you also, you also can Google this on your own, you know, farm grants, look that up. There are some good resources out there, but I think talking with someone is really important. And so I would encourage you to reach out to either the farm raise team or your local extension office if you have a relationship with them or the USDA, which as I said, has county level service centers pretty much all across the country. So they're gonna be good resources for you in order to find the best options. And then you're gonna to need to plan the grant specifics and gather the resources that you need. So this is deadlines. When is the grant due? Is this an application that's gonna require me to fill out paperwork? Or is this an application in which I need to write a big narrative and illustrate my story? Um, think about funding disbursement cycles. Grants are not quick. It takes many months to hear back and then many more months to get the funding. So if it's a grant related project, you got to be in it for three to eight months of a timeline in terms of getting an answer and getting capital, um, sometimes even longer. <laughs> and then the, the third piece or fourth piece here is um, making sure that you have proper registrations and we're going to go through that now. Registrations. So as a farmer, you might be a sole proprietor, so you might be farming under your own social security number, or you could be an LLC or a corporation. Either one is fine. You can apply for grants no matter what your business structure is, but you are going to need some additional registrations in order to apply. So the biggest one that I think I would encourage everyone to get, regardless of what you're planning to do for in terms of grants, is a farm number. And this is basically a, a four digit code that the USDA assigns to your farm. And you might get multiple of these if you're a larger farm that helps them identify your land in their system. And they'll associate you with that land. And the reason this is important is that the, the USDA has all these different agencies in it and they all talk to each other about grant recipients based on this farm number code. Um, and so to, to get this number, you have to set up records with the Farm Service Agency. It can be an easy process if you have a lot of local resources, if your USDA service center is um, well staffed and able to assist you. It can be a very confusing process and the paperwork can be heavy if you don't have a ton of help at the local level. So FarmRaise has created a digital application to expedite this and to make sure that we get those records filled out for you and submitted in a timely and effective way so that you can get that farm number. There's a second set of registrations that you actually don't need for every grant, but for certain grants, you will. And so a really popular grant is the Value Added Producer Grant. This is an awesome opportunity for you to get federal funding to expand your marketing, reach a new customer segment, or use a new channel like digital marketing to reach your customers. The APG does require you to have a SAM and a DUNS number. And these are numbers that are given to you by um, the agencies. So SAM is run by the government and DUNS is run by a company called DUNS and Bradstreet. And the US government uses these numbers to identify businesses or individuals it creates contracts with. And so it's really not too hard to do this on your own to apply for Sam and Dunn's, but I would recommend blocking off an hour to do it because you have to give a lot of contact information, talk about the structure of your organization, talk about what you do, and you just want to make sure you're not rushing through that or stressed as you fill it out. Um, and one thing to note, if you are going to apply for VAPG, it does take some time to get these numbers. So Dunn's is pretty quick. It's about two business days. And then Sam can take 10 to 15 days until you get that number after you submit. And so if you decide to apply for VAPG, for example, you want to do this right away, instantly when you, when you decide to apply. Um, the other thing I will say about these numbers is that it's free to apply for all of these. You should not be charged to apply for any of these numbers. 
Um, there are some companies out there that'll ask you to pay them like 500 bucks to, to apply for Sam and Duns. If you don't have time, for sure, go with that if you have the cash, but also you can do it yourself. So please know that. Um, yeah, I think that covers this one. There are some instructions on how to apply for Sam and Duns. It's pretty clear. Um, you can just type it into Google and there will be like a set of instructions that walk you through the process. I'm also happy to provide those to you. My email is sammy, S-A-M-I at farmraise.com and you're welcome to reach out and I can help you think through that. And then um, I often get this question from farmers, which is that, you know, can I apply for multiple grants at once? And yes, and I think you should. The reason is that you're probably not gonna get 100% of the things you apply for because grants are competitive to some extent. Um, but do note that if you somehow got two grants for the same project happening at the same time on your farm, you can only pick one of them. You're not gonna be able to use both for the same purpose. So now I'm gonna wrap it up by sharing a little bit about what we've built at Farm Raise and how it can help you. And then I'm super keen to hear your questions for all of us here. So at Farm Raise, what we've done is built a platform that helps you identify grant options, and then saves you time because we're making the application process fast and painless. And we specialize in the paperwork part of it. So really helping you get that paperwork done in a timely way. Um, an example of this is that to file your FSA records, you have to fill out some forms that require you to put your contact information repetitively in like five or six different places. We've streamlined that so you only have to enter that information once and then it auto populates the right forms for you. That's just one example of, of how we're looking at that challenge and trying to save you some time. Um, and then we do update you on new programs. So we have a database now of over a thousand federal and state grant programs. And we're also tracking tax incentives and carbon programs. And we keep you updated on those programs and let you know when deadlines are coming up and how you can take action if you're serious about something. And then we do have a support team. So we're just a phone call or text away. If you have any questions, we have office hours for our premium members. So you can set up 30 minute chats with our team whenever you have a question and we're there for you. We're with you on the phone to talk through everything. And we, the biggest thing is getting clarity, knowing what your next step is so that you can actually proceed with your plans. So as I said today, um, we do offer application support. We're building this common app where we can help you apply for lots of different opportunities after you enter information just once. But today, all we can do with that common app is help you apply to EQIP, which is a natural resources uh, grant or cost share program. And then we also can help you establish your farm service agency records, as I mentioned, but we're gonna keep building on top of that moving forward. We are, this is sort of our roadmap for the next year in terms of what we're adding in for you. Um, we're going to expand that common app to include a full spectrum of the year of funding for your farm. So we can key you in and help you apply at various points of the year. We are building in capacity to help you with grant reporting and tracking on the back end because our customers are asking for that. And then we are gonna enable text-based coaching. It's been really fun to learn over the past year how much you all love to text us. And so we want to make that more available to you and get you the support you need when you need it in the field. We do charge, so we have a free account, which is all about education. You can access our funding library, which is that database of a thousand programs and learn about different programs. Um, but we also have for our premium members, the extra features like office hours, deadline notification, um, and then application support. Okay, taking a step back, the summarized roadmap, what you should take away from this presentation is to think about your approach to farm funding as a set process that requires some time and attention, but you can have support on your way. So the first step, you really need to take stock, set your vision, chart your goals, know what it is you want funding for. Second, learn about your options. This webinar was a great overview. There's more work to do though. So know, know about your options, take our eligibility quiz, talk to your extension office, talk to us, 
will help you identify what's out there for you. Draw up your funding map. When are the deadlines? What action items do you have to do at each step of the way to make sure you're on top of it? And then you execute and you apply. So with that, thank you all. Very excited to hear what's top of mind for you and, and discuss. Thanks, Sammy. That was great. Um, we did get a couple of questions in the chat as you were going and, um, and I'll throw those at you in a second. Anyone else with some emerging questions, feel free to just come off mute uh, or add them into the chat now. Um, but first, Sammy, um, John was wondering if feasibility grants are available to startup farms. You could definitely apply to feasibility or planning grants. Um, the value added producer grant is an example of one that has a planning component. The, it's gonna be difficult to illustrate your prior history if you haven't built the business up. Um, but I have seen cases in which startup farms have surpassed that by having a really good business plan and using a lot of market research to support that. Um, so the in that case, you would just really wanna work either with your team or with a grant writer to do a lot of that market research. And then another quick one from John as well. He was curious to know if any um, loans or grants that are out there are available to uh, veteran ag entrepreneurs. So veterans who are starting up farms. I know at least with FSA, there are allocated funds for those groups, but I don't believe they have special rates for them. Um, do you know anything about grants available to veterans? Um, there are, so as Erica was saying, that the USDA basically sets aside five to 10% of funds through their loan programs and their grant programs for veteran beginning and historically um, underserved farmers. And so it's not like you're getting a special rate, you're just getting less competition and more prioritization from them in the grant pools. For grants, like I said in the presentation, you can access some special perks. So you can get like half of the funds up front instead of having to do it all reimbursement. I've also got Brian curious if there are any grants you know of for aquaculture. I'm sure I'm not sure of any. This is so tricky. It's uh, you'll, the USDA is wonderful in so many ways, but they're also a little old school. And so indoor agriculture and aquaculture are not, as loved or given as much attention yet. Um, that's probably gonna change. There are a couple programs that you can apply to for aquaculture. Um, the value added producer grant for business development, if you wanna increase your sales um, or improve your marketing channels, that's a good one. And then the SARE program has done quite a few aquaculture projects. Um, and you can go to SARE.org and search their project database. Just type in like aquaculture and it'll come up with the grants that they've previously funded related to that. I don't see any more in the chat. Um, oh wait, we've got John Kluge. <laughs> Thanks for all your participation, John. Um, curious to know if there are specific grants for pollinating um, bees, flowers, that sort of thing. Getting more into the niche products. <laughs> yes, love this. So this is like your, your human eligibility quiz. Um, yes, same thing as aquaculture, SARE, VAPG are good ones. Um, you might look at EQIP, which is an NRCS program, but you it would have to be tied to a resource concern. So, um, and it like you can get EQIP to put in pollinator habitat on your land, for example. So that could be a good thing if you're trying to increase the availability of forage for your bees. There is, I'm seeing a couple other here, um, urban agriculture grants. Yes, there, the USDA two years ago put out an urban agriculture specific grant. Um, it was targeted at like nonprofit or mission driven urban agriculture businesses. Um, so that's something to look into. But if you type in USDA urban agriculture grant, that'll pop up. And then you can also access the ones that I've already mentioned, not EQIP per se, but um, SARE and VAPG are, you can apply as an urban agriculture farm as well. 
And then do we have a limit on the grants provided? Is that, a, are you asking, like, is there a cap on the amount you can receive or is that another limit? The amount, each grant is gonna have its own specific cap. So um, like the SARE grant and the Southern region, I believe it's like around $20,000 for a producer grant, that's the cap. Um, for EQIP, you can actually get up to like $450,000 over a five-year period. For smaller farmers, you're not gonna run into that uh, cap. And so it really just depends on the grant program. Great. Ooh, let's see, one more. What do you see as the most urgent gaps that private philanthropy can plan? Um, and is the Virginia Funders Network engaged with us at all? Um, let's see. Michael, do you want to address that actually? Uh, yeah, sure. Um, in answer to the second question, um, the Funders Network is engaged a little bit. Um, Matt Illion, um, who I think John, as you may know, is no longer in Virginia, but he has been a big advocate of our work uh, since launching the Impact Investors Forum, um, but not enough. <laughs> so uh, yeah, we'd like to certainly see more of that. Um, and I think philanthropy can certainly support the work um, by, um, you know, helping um, helping with, uh, in particular, the work we do. You know, supporting our lending program through, um, you know, operational capital and and loan loss reserves. Um, you know, we are sharing risk with with farmers. So, um, in doing that, you know, we have to really be uh, cautious, uh, you know, on our balance sheet. And so uh, having uh, philanthropy uh, to back up the, um, you know, the, the borrowed capital that we use for our loan program is, is critical. So um, yeah, I hope that answers the question. We've also got one from Lily, um, who's farming in North Carolina and who I know well. Um, and she's curious about the geographic range of loans that we offer at Food Shed Capital. And currently most of our work is in Virginia, but we are partnering with other organizations in states throughout the Mid-Atlantic. And North Carolina is one of the states where we've begun working. Um, so a lot of times that's mostly because you know, Michael and Indy and I are limited in our geographic range. We really like to visit uh, farms as part of our approval and underwriting process, just to get a, you know, a sense of your operation, meet you in person, that sort of thing. Um, but if you are, if, if we uh, can connect with you and connect with a partner organization in your state, um, even if you're not in North Carolina, we're happy to have a conversation with you. And I'll put a link in the chat here to, um, to our page on our website that talks all about how our lending process works and how to get in touch. Um, and I'll just, um, the question about grant writing. Um, so we don't do narrative-based grants right now. They're a little trickier to put into a digital application. So what we offer to premium members is connecting you with grant writers. So for example, last year, we vetted and connected two of our premium members with a VAPG expert, and she wrote their grants for them, and they were both funded through her. So we're going to continue that with her this year. We've got someone for the rural energy program that we work with as well. We've covered most everything. Am I missing any in here, guys? They've been coming in so fast here in the last few minutes. Yeah, if we've missed anything, uh, feel free to unmute and shout out. You know, we just don't want to overlook. I know there's been a lot of great things in the chat, so um, definitely want to give everybody the opportunity. So don't hesitate to unmute if we've missed you and just shout your question.
And I'll also put our contact information in here. So you're, um, you can certainly email all of us, Sammy as well, to stay connected. Um, uh, if that, if you don't remember emails or websites, just check us out on social media. We're pretty easy to find. Um, and we're always happy to keep the conversation going with you guys after the fact. And we will again send out the recording and we'll send out our contact information and uh, you'll have all that. Yeah. And the present the presentations themselves we can send you as well. All right. India, you want to wrap us up? Sure. Yeah. I just want to thank everyone again for participating. Um, and Sammy, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. Um, and just to reaffirm, you know, if you have any questions, even if you're not sure about a loan or, or a grant in the case of farm raise, um, but you just kind of want to chat things through, definitely don't hesitate to reach out. Erica and I are both available. Um, yeah, so please, please reach out at any time. Um, and stay tuned as well for the future workshops in this series. Um, so you can subscribe to our newsletter to stay on top of all of that. Um, you can also keep in touch with us through social media. Um, but we'll be releasing more information about those in the coming months. Um, yeah, thank, thank you all so much. Thank you all so much for joining thank us. Thank you. Well done. Thank you all. Take care. Got a few lingerers. <laughs> Not sure if any of you have extra questions or if you're just getting work done while you webinar. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Dara Burns, are you still there? <laughs> Um, let's see, Michael, are you able to capture the chat? Yeah, I'm going to, I need to stop recording. Okay. Um, I think some people maybe walk away.